Welcome to the podcast called Wits yes. End. We are at our Wits End today, and we are going to talk about a topic that will, if it has not yet, it will push you to your Wits End. That's it. Dude. <laughs> We're going to begin with a proverb from Lebanon. Very famous proverb. First is Brother George is going to give it to us in Arabic, and then he's going to translate it for us so that we can understand the truth and the importance of this topic. Deep, deep Lebanese proverbs. Not Solomon's, but qu close enough. Maybe it's a Hiram proverb. It okay. says, it's it's uh, in the form of a rhetorical question. Does anybody invite the bear to his own vineyard? I.e., it's a foolish thing to do, you know. <laughs> we also say, uh, stay away from evil and sing unto it. Like, just keep it happy. Keep it away. <laughs> you, you, know, you would say, don't poke the bear. That's why I thought of that. Oh, okay. Okay, so we are going to invite the bear to the vineyard. Yeah, the growling discontent bear. Yes. And what is that bear? The bear is, we saw a man casting out devils and he followeth not us <laughs> and we forbade him. Um, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. We're going to talk about that today. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to step away from our, our narrative on Genesis and we're going to talk a little bit about, about going camping in Christianity. We're going to go camping today and uh, just a little bit. And, I, you know, I don't want to pretend that I know about, you know, each of the uh, idiosyncrasies and the characteristics of every camp. But I'll give a little bit of my background. George, you give your background and then we'll we'll just see where it takes us. And we've prayed fervently beforehand that we do not get into anything that's just nonsense because it's easy to get offended. Um, yeah, after I give my background, I want to ask you. If you can give me a breakdown, I think it'd be helpful for everybody. And you're as good a man as, as any that I know of all the different camps and the kind of their peculiarities. Like, like if I were going to draw, to draw, forgive me, to draw a diagram of the different main camps, you know, and kind of what identifies each and maybe a little bit of history. I don't know if that's, I'm asking too much of you, well, but just I, a sketch of that, I'll I'd be helpful best. because it's still confusing kind of to me, even after okay. all these years. I'll do my best. My background is this. I was uh, I was born as the first son of uh, my parents. My, my parents had six girls and then That's... number seven is a boy. And then uh, perfection, me, girl, boy, girl. Perfection, number seven. That's right. The promised seed. That's it. <laughs> That's it. And uh, the worst part about it were the hand-me-downs. That's an old joke, <laughs> old joke, but it's just, it, it works. So uh, my dad was um, born and raised in West Virginia, and uh, his in West Virginia, there were small, of course, very small communities, and there was a man that used to travel on mule up and down the hills as a circuit riding preacher. And uh, my dad does not remember him, but his, he went and saw his aunt one time, and they were wa his aunt was watching television, and there was B.R. Lakin on the television. Uh, evangelist and and she said he's the guy that used to come down on the mule to right. uh to Hold us my mule so <clears throat> so so that that was my dad's background west virginia then he got saved um in 1953 at the akron baptist temple and at that time the akron baptist temple was the largest church uh in this in america had the largest Sunday school in america and um wow. it was you know very influential and they were connected with the baptist bible fellowship he was he was instrumental though he was not one of norris's boys as they called him but he was kind of his own man um did his own thing for for years and years and so he recommended to my dad to go to baptist bible college in springfield missouri which my dad did i believe so you're when, saying br lakin was his own no yeah who was his own man uh i'm sorry his, his pastor thank you his pastor was uh, Dallas Billington. Okay. Uh, okay. I've heard of that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it was, you know, it, it was a gigantic church. Um, Dad said he'd be on the property when they had 10,000 people in attendance. They had an escalator from the lower oh. to the upper, you know, parking lots uh, from the parking lot up to the building and um, elevators in there and just all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. And they actually chartered, this was before the, the bus ministry per se, they chartered the bus, um, the city buses to bring people just ride the buses to church on wow. Sunday. And during World War II, they actually stopped them 
and Brother Billington successfully lobbied Congress to say, look, you're going to let the beer trucks run on Sunday. You should let our trucks run, hmm. uh, our, our, our buses. And so they did. And Dad would ride the bus to church from his home there in Akron. And uh, it was just a city bus. He'd hop on it so, and they'd take them. So to me, I'm, as a Lebanese, some of the stuff is fascinating just for the geography. West Virginia, you said, right? Isn't yeah. there? Isn't there? Don't you guys have a song about West Virginia country roads or something like that? We certainly do. That's West Virginia, right? Almost heaven, West Virginia. John Denver made it very popular. John Denver. Yeah. There you go. Wow. I know he someone not... from West Virginia. Actually, he... I, I know the Newmans. They were from West Virginia. No, Pastor Joel, I think, from Virginia and Miss Mitzi from West Virginia. But they're up in Alberta. West Virginia broke off at the Civil War because they wanted to be with the Union, the North. And Virginia, of course, being the home of oh. uh, Robert E. Lee, it stayed with the, uh, the Confederacy. Okay, and, that's why it's not East Virginia. Got right. it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, Virginia and uh, the Old Dominion, and then West Virginia. So, um, so Dad went off to BBC, graduated in 1959. Hard to believe, but uh, back then, there was really not a lot of options as far as independent fundamental Baptists. And so the BBC had started, I believe, in 1950. And uh, Okay, so yeah, who's the... So to put you where I am, what I do know kind of vaguely is that ironically enough, the kind of the, the creators, if I, if I can use that term of the mega church movement were actually independent Baptists, like J, J um, what is his name? Norris? J. Frank Norris. J. Frank Norris, right. He kind of, I think broke off from the Southern convention, went on his own. Yep. Um, Bill Grady says that basically the, the Philadelphia church age died with him in 1952. That's kind of all I know. And then I know there's, so I know nothing. If, if you're talking to a guy like me, you know, all those cliques and BBC, I, I know nothing of that. Can you just give us like what those things are? Yeah. The, yeah. So the, the Southern Baptist Convention actually split off of the Northern Baptist Convention, of course, connected oh. with the Civil War. Um, really? And, yeah. There was a lot of it. Wow. Uh, as a result, because Southern Baptist Convention was not as rapidly anti-slavery at the time and okay. and of course the northern baptist convention stayed more in, you know so our geography affected our um our theology in that sense hmm. and uh so but 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 southern baptist church also was historically more biblical they were you know i think they were wrong in slavery but they were they were right in a lot of other areas mm -hmm. but as time went on um of course money corrupts you know the love of money is the root of all evil it corrupted the churches more and more and they became more uh, politicized and they would and and through the southern baptist seminaries such as baylor university where um lester roloff graduated from places like that and uh you know the southwestern seminary and others and of course i'm not the best we gotta have brother alter back on to really dig into this stuff he'll he'll help us a lot but they began to, to deny um the infallibility of scripture they begin to deny the miracles they begin to deny the genesis account of you know chapter one to two of uh god created okay trying to adopt evolution this is the northern uh, this is southern. Southern. and northern, oh, southern was also doing it too southern was already doing that back then yes back in the 1920s and 30s <clears throat> yeah wow. and of course the Thunder Memphis convention is a is a loose they, yeah they, they say it's loose but um it's not technically a hierarchy in the sense of you know, you think of the Roman Catholic Church. It's not technically like that, but right. there is a confederation. They are, you know, yeah. lumped together. And it's not a denomination. I learned that a few years ago, to my surprise. A lot of people outside the States think of Southern Baptist as its own denomination. But it's not, right? It's just a confederacy. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a of connection sorts. of people. So um, although you can get kicked out of, uh, of the Southern Baptist Convention, which amazingly, Rick Warren was last year yeah yeah i gave him the boot amen that that's amazing that that actually happened but, praise god um so so anyhow that the southern baptist convention was was still going great guns but j frank norris was a southern baptist which which interestingly enough dr ruckman was as well when he started ministry and um so norris started standing up and he was a little bit of a um what would you call him uh, he was a, a promoter and he was he was very good at creating a, a spectacle 
And he was, you know, if you ever been around Dr. Hiles with the, the huge promotion Sundays and the, you know, we're going to swallow goldfish or we're going to, you know, have a, a evil can evil guy jump over 10 buses or whatever, stuff like that to attract people. Right. Well, Norris was in that way before. Right. He, he was big time promoter. And so he had a paper that really uh, attacked the Southern Baptist seminary professors. And he'd go after them. He'd call them all kinds of names. And he stood very strongly against communism. At the time, he stood uh, with Israel and and helped to to really lead up to uh, the 1948 you know establishment of Israel. He was in that fight well before and beyond. So he was he was always promoting you know the, promoting um, and he was doing good stuff. But there was a lot. Of, it was kind of almost like your um, tabloid type of the stuff. Yeah, right. You know, like right. wow, salacious stuff. And as time went on, you know, maybe, maybe on a slow news day, things would would kind of like, okay, we're going to start attacking other people that maybe are not really guilty of it or whatever. And it grew to the point where he was such a polarizing figure that a guy named um, Chips, I think it was D.E. Chips was the guy's name, that actually came into Norris's office. And Norris believed, had reason to believe, the guy had called him before he came up and was, you know, yelling at him and cussing at him and told him he's going to come and kill him. And so he came up to his office and he reached into his coat. Yeah. And at that point, Norris pulled out a gun and shot him. Yeah. Well, Bill, Bill Grady says that that was a, the alcohol kind of a cartel. He was sent from them. Mm -hmm. And then the first time he, he talked him out of it and he went back down, when we saw him coming back the second time, then he knew he couldn't negotiate with him that second time and shot him. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, you know, he went to court, you know, he was, he was, uh, taken to court up in, uh, Austin and they had a, you know, big court battle and he ended up being absolved of any wrongdoing. And, uh, but, but for, for lack of a better phrase, he was kind of tainted in that sense. Or, right. You know, he was, what's the word labeled. Yeah. Cause you get the sense he was X'd out of history almost for some people. Yeah. Well, and some of that was, I think some of that was people got tired of, of the antics. They got tired of the, the overblown stuff. And then once the, the court battle happened, it was like, okay, so he got off, but you know, the guy died. So, it, and that's a hard thing to come back from. Right. Um, but what he did do, he, he, he was one of those guys that everybody loves to hate. Uh, but he did really establish a lot of this idea of standing firm and fallibility of scripture, standing firm on the virgin birth on the end you know, of the statehood of Israel. You know, he really stood firm on a lot of good things. Hmm. Well, he pastored simultaneously the, the two biggest churches in America, First that's Baptist crazy. Church of Fort Worth and Temple Baptist Texas. Church of Detroit. Michigan, in wow. Detroit, Michigan, from south to north. Yeah, and he would uh, he would fly back and forth. Sometimes take the train, and for whatever reason, it the story is interesting here. They called him up to Detroit for a meeting, and they kept asking him to pastor, and he said, "No, I'm pastor of a church already." And they kept pressuring him, and finally he relented and became the pastor. And they had a huge it's it's a very interesting story. Um, they had a huge influx of people join the church. It was a gigantic church. Well, what happened is. Um, he installed a man named G.B. Vick to be right, Beecham, Vick, yeah. this assistant pastor, basically, to be okay. kind of the quasi-pastor for him when he was not there. Okay. As time went on, um, Brother Vick, of course, gained in more, more sure. and more... Um, Classic. You know, it, it, what's the word? Uh, influence and was, was being much more effective and preaching more and all that kind of stuff. So there came a point in 1950, I believe it was, uh, that it came, it came to a head because what was happening is Brother Norris, it is, it is accused, it is said that he would be, he would arbitrarily do things, just unilaterally change things. Uh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. So there's a bunch of guys down there, uh, down in the Fort Worth uh, Seminary <clears throat> that were from Temple Baptist in Detroit. And okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, so there's a seminary in Fort Worth. Thank you. Yes. That is, who start, what's that? That's that's Norris's seminary. Oh, his own independent. Yes, he started it, and and actually a bunch of churches in the area contributed to it as well. Okay, it was large. It was an institute. Was and some of the guys institute. from Michigan, since he was their pastor too, or whatever, due to his uh, reputation, went down to Texas to join. Yes. Um, okay. And they were they were members down there uh, in the in the institute of the seminary. They were going, and there came a point when Norris. From the from the BBC side, they said Norris was acting like a tyrant, a dictator. 
Sorry, who's BBC? Uh, the Baptist Bible College. So I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. But they haven't they haven't come into into uh, existence yet. But these guys from Temple Baptist are are being influenced by G. B. Vick, these young men. And sorry, Temple ba who's Temple Baptist? Again? Temple Baptist in Detroit. In Detroit. Okay, that's the big church he's pastoring. Yep. And, okay. and he's also gotcha. pastoring First Baptist Fort Worth. Got it. Okay. Simultaneously. But, but okay. there's a rift here because of Norris's um, decisions and his manner of leadership. There, be, there develops a rift between these two groups. And somehow or other, there comes a point where Norris basically demands it's either you follow me or you know, we're changing all this. This is not, you're not doing what I told you to do. This is not working. Um, I want to change. I can't read. I have to go back. I've got the books on my shelf. I could, I could, you know, okay. show people whatever. And and there's two sides, of course, to every story, <clears throat> but it, it kind of got nasty in a, in a fellowship meeting or in a big, you know, group meeting. It got nasty. People were yelling mm -hmm. stuff back and forth. Well, yeah. what happens is eventually the group that was saying, Norris is a tyrant, a tyrant dictator. They decided to split off. And um, and one of the guys, there's actually a guy named Gene Milioni, who was a, a young student from Detroit, who was with Brother um, Vic, kind of yeah. on his side. And he kind of made him, I'm trying to remember exactly, I don't want to say anything wrong, but but, but basically called him out and and said these students are not doing what they should be doing and he, he did make things worse so there's a division between Beecham Vic now and J Frank Norris yes <clears throat> okay. yes so at that point then we uh we enter into a new realm now Vic joins up with a bunch of other men that were at the college and elsewhere and decides to form what's called the Baptist Bible College and it's going to be in Springfield Missouri so they're getting away from Fort Worth, Fort Worth, and Got it. eventually that continued on, and now I think it's connected. There's still a seminary down there. Maybe it's Arlington. And if you're if you're listening and you know the details, you know my aunt graduated from from that. I think in Missouri, from BB. Yes, yes. But they changed. They recently changed their name. I oh, did they? Like last year, yeah, yeah. Maybe the guys listening can confirm. But I think they just changed their name. Well, what was that called in Missouri? Baptist Bible College, the, the Promised Land of the Mormons, Baptist Bible College. Yeah, and it, no it was. I mean, it's definitely very oh, influential, and they were huge on Baptist on starting Bible churches. Okay. One of the interesting features of the of the college was that it was not under one ministry. They were very concerned about that because of Norris. And right. So they had a staff, but there were multiple churches, and and students could attend a variety of churches. There was like, I don't know how many churches that they could go to in the area. Okay. So my dad went to one of the big ones. Um, Pastor Dowell, W. E. Dowell of High Street Baptist Church. And uh that was a big one. There was, you know, a bunch of other ones as well. R. O. Woodworth was there and Dowell and um man, if you're listening, you, you know, if you grew up, grew up in this stuff, you you've used to hear these names all the time. These were the guys that really impacted. So my dad went there and uh, he got saved in fifty three, he went to the army for three years, and then he got out and he went down to BBC, I think in fifty six. Okay. And in 56, he started and he graduated in 59. That's amazing. So, and your dad is still walking this earth and he graduated still, in 59. Uh, it's hard to believe. Amazing. I mean, it's wild. He, <laughs> I graduated in the 50s. That's crazy. He'll, yeah, it's it's really crazy. Um, So what's what's interesting is... We should have him on. Oh, you're not kidding. We should. Would he? Would he do that? I think he would. Man, come on. 90 years of lifetime on earth? That's a great idea. I want to listen to that. That's a great idea. Yeah. He's a, he's a, you've met him, right? You know, oh, yeah. yeah. He's, he's a, he's a, he's a wild man. Yeah. Um, he's so full of energy in life. You know, he, he slowed down just a little bit since from when I was a kid. Oh, let's sure, have him on, man. Ask him, please. Oh yeah, I will. I will. So dad goes there. That's BBC. <clears throat> now that's, I have, I, I have to go as far as camps are concerned. That was the main camp that I remember growing up in, but then we also decided to dad would dad would go basically to different camps of independent Baptist churches. Uh, people would ask us to come and sing, and so some of the camps that we went to were places like. Um, okay, so I've got my my uh, scribble and my uh, Kindle scribe, so I'm going to draw this out right. Okay, so there's try to do it geographically. Okay, there's okay. so you said there's there's BBC in Missouri. Yep, BBC in Missouri. 
Missouri. And that's a uh, that's a Vic. That was Vic originally. He was he was the uh, okay. kind of the de facto leader. But okay. He was not. He was he was not like it was not part of his church. Right. Got it. Yeah. Because right. they were, we don't want a dictator. So from from sixties, I mean, they really were hitting it. Seventies, they had I think over twenty five hundred students there or something like that. Man. So and they it, were, I mean, it, just hitting on all cylinders. What's the one in Texas? That was uh, First Baptist of Fort Worth, and I think that was, oh, what was it called? Man, I should have been more prepared on all this. It's my fault. I'm the one who suggested that on the cuff. Seminary. There. Fort Worth. I, I, man, I feel like it was maybe Fort Worth Seminary. But, Texas. Um, no, nah, that's not it. I'll, I'll find worse. out. Man, okay. I'm, I'm sure so many people are listening to, like, screaming at the, <laughs> <laughs> this is what it is. All right, it, so I, I got two so far. Okay, yep, okay. yep. Okay, okay, now splitting off of BBC. Um, splitting in, off of BBC. Yeah, splitting off of B- BBC in. Okay, so that that continued to expand. That went to a place called PC BBC. They had a, a Western expansion that was in uh, California. Okay, Pacific so, Coast Baptist Bible College. That was an extension of that. Pacific. Okay. PC and BBC. That's PC in California. BBC, that was in California. I think it was in San Dimas, California. Yep. Okay, so um, those went like this. Okay. And then, and 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 they had another one in Boston called BBC East, and th- that was an extension, the Eastern exp- extension of Boston, and that never really went too far, from what I understand. There are people that obviously went there, but it was never the same height, even of PC BBC, because they got a nice piece of property out there in San Dimas, and it used to be like a a boarding school of some kind or whatever so yep okay so okay. pc bbc uh bbc east is gone and it's then gone now it, yeah yeah as far okay. as i know unless it became something else that i didn't know about but yeah it's yeah. gone okay and then around 19 um 1998 oh see. okay yeah, around 1998, um, church a bunch of churches together decided that there was a lot. There was some disagreement with the Baptist Bible Fellowship um, over policy, some financial problems, and and honestly, who's the Baptist <clears throat> Bible Fellowship? Yeah, the no, BBC is was part. BBC was uh, the college. And then all of the groups, all the churches connected with it are called the Fellowship, Baptist Bible Fellowship. Oh, okay. Let me write that so the story. college was part of the Fellowship. It was the kind of the, the, the huge, I mean, it was huge. Thousands of people, they were responsible for starting thousands of churches. And, what was it? Uh, what's the acronym of the Fellowship? BBFI. B, B, the BBF is what we always called it, the Baptist Bible Fellowship, BBF. But I think it was actually BBFI. Okay. Got it. So in 1998, um, the Heartland, I'm sorry, the uh, PCBBC side from California actually moved to Oklahoma City and it was renamed Heartland. Oklahoma is what, uh, what uh, state is that? Uh, Oklahoma City is in Oklahoma. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Kansas City is not in Kansas, right? That Well, there is a Kansas City, Kansas, but it's small. The big city is Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah, it's okay, right across so, the river. Okay. Then those guys, let's do moved they moved to oklahoma yep to okc and and that became and and one of the biggest things that's not you know necessarily mentioned if you look it up online but um it was the conservative it was the it was a pushback against the liberalism that was coming into the baptist bible fellowship um you know the churches were going along with the flow with music with any kind of uh, dress standards. It, it was, you know, heavily influenced by this the seeker sensitive movement of Bill Hybels and <clears throat> Yeah, and I remember okay. I remember that. Yeah. So Battle Creek Church. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so the Heartland, um the Heartland guys were like, hey, listen, this is not what we signed up for. This is not what it was. Doesn't okay. mean all that stuff was being was being introduced gradually in the seventies and eighties and it got it got weird. So really PC weird. BBC moves to Oklahoma because they want to stay conservative? That was a that was one of the major things. There, there was financial difficulties, and there was you know different policy disagreements. But you know the thrust of it really was, we're not going down the liberal road. 
we're, we're going to stay conservative. Which, which they had. Because, okay, okay, you know what? Because the BBFI was going liberal. Now, I got a friend of mine. Now, he's a, pa he's a pastor up in Quebec, uh, in eastern Quebec. Really good man, does the work of the Lord. And um, he went to Oklahoma. And to me, that didn't mean anything. You know, I just knew that he went to school in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Now, that means something. And yep. so now I'm going to break up fellowship with him. <laughs> you got to. You got to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, so what, what's interesting about that is the, one of the, uh, the big characteristics of the BBFI was the fellowship. The fellowship. And some would say maybe to a fault. But uh, I would say I think there's a strength in it. Obviously, there's a strength in fellowshipping and, and, and connecting. And that has continued in what they call now the Global Independent Baptist Fellowship, uh, as opposed to the BBFI. Oh, it's, that's it's been renamed. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so... Now the the that's the conservative side that went with Heartland or that became Heartland is oh. now the Global Independent Baptist Fellowship. Global Independent Baptist Fellowship, mm -hmm. and, and they're conservative uh, like Heartland. Yes. Yeah. And that's Heartland is the college. GIBF is the fellowship. Just like BBC was the college and BBFI was the fellowship. <clears throat> okay, so, so it's just a fellowship. Yes, just a fellowship, and they have and they have uh, yearly meetings. Um, they'll have, I don't know how many, but I know they have at least one national meeting every year. Everybody comes from all over the place, and a lot of times uh, there are there are state fellowships as well. So um, okay. there, there's a Buckeye fellowship here in Ohio, and uh, you know a lot of good men. And you know, they come together to encourage one another, and they meet in different churches throughout the throughout the year. And, uh, and then they'll have a global cool. fellowship or, or a national fellowship meeting where everybody comes together once a year, typically in a nice warm place in the winter time or something like that. You know, cool. where they can connect and re get refreshed and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So that that's where it kind of stands today with them. Um, the other one, when I was coming up, there were two other ones that were really big, like that I remember as a kid, and then it kind of changed. Um, the other one was Tennessee Temple. Okay, and I've heard of that. Tennessee Temple University. That was started in 1946. Wait, let me, I, I want to open up a map of the states to figure this thing out because map of I deal with a lot of my American friends. They tell me about a state, and then they just put two letters. Oh, first state. Okay. Like, yes. What are you talking about? I can, you know, kind I of can figure out most of them, but okay, let's go. So if I go here. Yeah, it's somewhere in the middle. Okay. So yeah, no, yeah, my sister's in Tennessee, so it is relative to Missouri. It would be Southeast. Okay. Yeah. So, so that would be, that's, what is that called? You said Tennessee Temple University. Tennessee Temple University. Okay. Yep. And, Sexton. And that was that was somewhat um he again it, his most popular statement that was that was founded by Lee Robertson. And uh that 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 uh, Lee Robertson Tennessee yep. Temple. Yep. Lee and he his most popular statement was um everything rises and falls on leadership. Now I don't on leadership. I don't know if he if he, you know, invented it, originated it, but it was certainly was, uh, he popularized it. And who, who was Lee Robertson? Yes. And he, he was also, um, he also studied at a Southern Baptist school in Louisville. Um, he went to Louisville and he, he went to a Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. So, you know, Dr. A.T. Robertson. Robertson. Okay. So he started Lee. in that and then he gradually came out as well. I don't know when or how, I don't know any of that story at all, but he was an evangelist for, evangelist for a while and he became a pastor and he started, he started. Right. Um, okay. Oh, okay. So it's Lee Robertson. Robertson. R no, T R O B E R S O N. Yep. Okay. And so he, he, um, he was called to a church in Chattanooga there. That's the Highland park Baptist church. And so then that's when things just started rolling. He had a radio station, bus ministry, you know, he had camp joy and all that. 
and they had just thousands of members. They said at one point they had 57,000 members. So there's, okay, he's the founder of Tennessee Temple University and then Temple Baptist Seminary. Yes, exactly. Temple, uh, he started two schools? Well, the, there's a college and then the seminary was the extension, like the master's program, That's the okay. continuing education. Got you. So TTU and Temple Baptist Seminary. Yeah. And there's, they also were, were, you know, turned out a lot of graduates. Uh, in fact, the first place that I worked, um, I worked for Pastor Jim Townsley in Southington, Connecticut. He graduated in 1975 from Tennessee Temple and he became, uh, decided he, he, what he did was he looked at where, do, where do we need churches in America? And, uh, he looked at population. He looked at the number of churches and he decided to go to the Northeast. He was from Indiana. You know, Midwestern guy, just kind of a, grew up playing basketball, uh, farmer type kid, and he decided to go to the Northeast. You guys call Indiana North Midwest? Uh, yeah, because of um, before the westward expansion. Oh, okay. Uh, it was Got considered, it. you know, the West. Got it. It, it used to be considered the West in the in the uh, early 1800s, and like it was the frontier. And then as time went on, it was just considered the Midwest, even though it's not technically the middle of yeah, it's kind of, I always find it odd that you guys call it the Heartland Bible Conference in, at uh, Toledo, Hope Baptist mm -hmm. Church. And I look at the map, and Ohio is like northeast. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's true. Uh, it's considered the Midwest, and and people generally in America consider it kind of the the heartbeat. This area, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan. It's very. Um, it's connected with a lot of our history, and a lot of people came from there, grew up there, that kind of thing. But uh, okay. So, so he started that church and there was lots and lots. Uh, in fact, I think brother Rogers, I think brother Rogers went to Tennessee temple for a while. Mark Rogers, we were talking about him earlier. Um, so we have and, to break up fellowship with him too. Oh yeah, man. The list and just, said, you know, us. we're populating the list now. Yeah. And I, and that's the thing. It, you, if you may think you have friends, but you can find reasons to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> and we work. That's hard why we're it. doing this podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, my soul. But um, so that that was also a strong s school for um, training evangelists, pastors, um, missionaries, some missionaries. BBFI put out tons of missionaries. Um, Tennessee Temple was much more uh, about starting churches and pastoring churches and ministry that ministries, that kind of stuff here okay. in the States from okay. what from what I know. And there okay. were some good. They were also really good with music. Um uh, Baptist Bible College did do did have some good musicians and so forth, but they were much. Their emphasis was by uh, church planning, church planning, church planning. Like, what are you? Where are you starting a church? That's what it was all about. Tennessee Temple was a lot more even on the uh, bus ministry, education, um, like training a lot of teachers and uh, a lot of a lot of pastors and preachers. You know, they really emphasized. I love, soul I love how the Lord. You know, I find too many times. People play to their strengths and we kind of blame them for it, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, they emphasize it's only this, nothing else. Well, that's their strength. That's, that's kind of what the Lord gave them to focus on. And, and yeah, the exactly. Lord, when you zoom out, he actually said the body of Christ is pretty well balanced, that there's a head. Yeah. You know, and, and the organs it, in the body specialize, right? In certain functions. Absolutely. Exactly. So we, exactly. Well, if we, you're... Well, we have here in Canada is like that. It's an emphasis. We have a little fellowship and the emphasis is planting churches a lot. Mm. So I love it. And I think, honestly, I, I think that that is, um, and again, no, it's not that no one in Tennessee Temple, from Tennessee Temple started churches, obviously. Right, no, no, said, yeah. Right. My, you know, my, my former pastor did, and I mean, he was there for 40 <clears throat> years. I mean, it was ridiculous. He was hard-headed. He stayed up there with those hard North East, Northeasters, and, and he got the church going, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. eventually started a college themselves up there. Um, and uh, so that's, it's really cool to see uh, New England Baptist College. And it's cool to see how the Lord is, has used different strokes for different folks. Um, but one thing is interesting about Dr. Robertson is that he actually studied music for a while, uh, I think at the University of Cincinnati. And so he, he had a great understanding of music and they had really great music there at the, at that church. Um, a lot of musicians cool. were trained there. And so it's really kind of cool. Um, the other major that I can remember, the other major, um, camp big camp was the bob jones camp is what we called it 
started, you know, Bob Jones College, I think originally in Tennessee and it went to Florida for a while or vice versa. Was it Florida, then Tennessee? I can't remember. Um, if you're a Bob Jones grad, I know you know this like the back of your hand. My, my uncle, cousins are there. My cousins are Bob Jones. Okay. And my so, my cousins also went to school there. Really? South Carolina, right? Yeah. Greenville. Greenville. I know this one, Bob Jones. Yeah. So one of the things that they were really heavy uh, emphasized was uh, they were really good with structure um, and, and uh, discipline and orthodoxy. Uh, they, they were considered, you know, standing for the fundamentals of the faith. So Bob um, Jones, he came out of what? He was a Methodist. Was he his own man? A Methodist evangelist. And, a Methodist, uh, so my cousins are dead to me. Yeah, yeah. So, so Bob there. Jones. It never was. It never was considered strictly a Baptist school, hmm. although they're very Baptistic, and there have been a lot of a lot of Baptists that have gone there. But it was it was not strictly a Baptist school. Methodist. Um, and and honestly, the Methodists were probably a lot more Baptistic back then yeah. than a lot of Baptists are today. But you know, he was a dynamic preacher, and he was everywhere, and he had a real burden for young people, and so he had that following where it was like people were like who where is he going to be at and so he was able to start that and i should probably look that up real quick because that was i, I thought for sure it started i know there was two places it was either um in florida first and then went i thought i've actually read that somewhere i forgot you're, you're saying bf uh bbfi was more missionary minded and tennessee temple university more yeah, they were, they were, I'm sure there were plenty of missionaries that yeah. came out of, out of Tennessee Temple, but BBFI was really known for that. It was known for missionaries. All They, they called it Baptist Bible Fellowship International, and they, they would put out um, a directory, and they'd be all over the world, all over the world. It's interesting, you know, you're saying that, that the more, so like the guys who are more teachy, um, associated with the, with the, um, well, university and college, even though I know BBC originally was a college, but the more academic mm -hmm. end up being the ones who are more focused on planting churches, whereas the other ones are more focused outwardly to uh, send out and evangelize. I don't know well, if I'm seeing a uh, nuance there, if, if it's valid or not, but that's, that's what I'm getting right now. I would say it all depends on the thrust. Like the, the BBF, I think that coming from the standpoint of um it's not about building this one school okay or, or i'm sorry building this one, one church, church yeah i think that it helps to think okay we multiple churches oh, and, right right and and that's one thing the academic side has some strengths but there's a danger in it as well because if you who are you trying to impress with your academics if you're trying to impress the secular university then you're going to lean right. towards guys who have degrees from secular universities and maybe sweep some of his, mm -hmm. you know, her heresy under the rug because he's degreed. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. He's, he's been through it. He's been trained through that very top-notch place. And so we can kind of excuse some stuff. Um, I feel like that's one of the undoing, in my personal opinion, about hmm. the Tennessee Temple because it no longer exists. Highland Park changed. I think it's called Church of the Highlands now. Tennessee Temple University is gone. Tennessee Temple what, Sorry, what's Highland Park again? That was the the school. I'm sorry. That was the church that Lee Robertson was pastor of. Oh, from the church okay. came Tennessee Temple. So, oh, so Tennessee Temple. It's not Sexton at the Tennessee Temple, or um, or so, no. that's something else. No, that's another. That's another group. That's another group. Okay. But, but, but that. But interestingly enough, we can we can go there. That was founded in the early 90s. Um, Carl oh, Sexton was was kind of the uh, the golden boy of Lee Robertson. Okay. Um, one of he was on staff there with Lee Robertson for a while. Then he was pastor in New Jersey. Then he came to Tennessee, and they started uh, Crown the Crown College of the Bible. I think okay. it's called Crown College. Tennessee Crown College. It's in in Powell, Tennessee, which is on the on the east side of Tennessee, Tennessee whereas Chattanooga was further Crown west. Crown College. That's like ten. And uh, that's you, a, did, go ahead. I was going to say that is another uh, was another solid school, and and they're still going today. Although Brother Sexton passed away last year. Oh, he did. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Okay. Yep. Did you ever did you ever watch uh, that Bill Grady message that he preached? Yes, there? I did. Seven <laughs> signs of pseudo King James Onlyism. Yes, I did. And he was he was asked to please not come again and preach that <laughs> night. He he went in and dropped a bomb. <laughs> you know, I must have watched that message three four times. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, and see the, the the challenge, and this is this is where. Um, you know, we'll get to our kind of background as well. 
but the challenge is that there's when you when you get when you start studying something academically you cannot divorce your study from faith without faith it is impossible to please god and uh so what happens is in, in academics you have of, often you'll have a pastor and you'll have a president or the lead academic academic what do they call them academician yeah academician who is not so much on the spiritual strength he's more on the educational side right and so the pastor he believes the word of god by faith but he hasn't ever really studied all of the manuscript right. evidence he hasn't gotten into it and so the guy who has studied it supposedly is the learned professor right. he knows exactly. we lean on him but he doesn't believe it by faith in fact he doesn't believe it at all he just he he, he is not convinced right. because obviously secular you know secular authorities are not convinced that jesus christ is the son of god right because it requires faith it's and they don't want to have yeah, faith it's funny you mentioned that that's, i was just mentioning that in prayer this morning to the lord like <clears throat> that's one of the reasons i'm i'd like to see one of the reasons i'm taking a hebrew and accredited course i'd like to see it'd be nice to see some guys who are full-on academics and have studied this stuff out that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the scholars and still be you know bible believers that take the lord the word of god simply Mm -hmm. You know, it, it well, is possible. And the, and the problem, what happens is eventually you get to a point where you can't prove it. You have to take it by faith. And right. you believe God's word over man's word. And you have to be comfortable with that because they are, if you if you really study their position out, and now I'm getting, getting familiar with it being in an accredited course, they're in the same position. Yes. Just in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think it's good to have some, he said not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He didn't say not any. Right. Um, and I think that you've got people, for instance, the Apostle Paul, who was certainly uh, as learned as anyone in the scriptures. Right. And he could hold his own in, in any court. And I think the problem, though, is that if you follow that, I am right. I want to be the best. I want to exceed anyone. You're basically worshiping yourself and God will not share his glory with another. So you have to at some point feel stupid. Right. To right. Stay with God. Whether you are stupid or not, that's not that's a different question. But you feel you're to, you're made to feel stupid by other people. Um, that's good because you are worshiping an invisible God, and so I think that's where a lot of these places like Tennessee Temple they kept stacking hmm. the deck like we're going to improve, 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 improve. But but the whole point was big, bigger, better, faster, stronger. Well, what you said is biblical. Um, if any man, um, uh, if any man, let's see. Uh, this is First Corinthians chapter three, and Paul says, um, "For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God." Oh, here it is. Let no man deceive himself. First Corinthians three eighteen. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool mm. that he may be wise. And um, the more intellectually inclined yep. fear intellectual ridicule more than they do a slow Chinese death. And mm -hmm. I mean, I you know, I fear to everybody just fears that if you are in those circles, and you have to be willing to look like you are the fool in those circles, uh, even if your own intellect does fail and just kind of fall back on faith, which everybody does at the end of the mm -hmm. day anyway. So let's get back to um, where we were. Oh, Bob Jones, Bob Jones okay. University. Um, so over the, over the years, they've they're very strong in education, very strong in music. They've held the line for conservative music uh for for many many years um and so there's we went to lots of churches to connect with bob jones although because our music was considered we called it classical grass uh, <laughs> you're kidding i'm not kidding that's what my parents called it really yeah. classical in the sense like traditional um well just like it's really more folk music but for whatever reason they said classical grass because it wasn't full-on bluegrass music and it wasn't full on classical music. It was it was kind of like folk um, music, um, traditional church music, all mashed up together. What's so a, what's a, was, if you were to pick one song, if you were to sing like a couple lines from one kind of typical song of what you guys um, sing? Let me think. Let me think here. I got. I've got one. I've got my guitar with me here. Good so, soldier with the sword always by his side. Yeah, so if I were to do like a song um, that we normally would do, it'd be like, When you finally learn to give it up, 
no matter just how small when you open up your hands to god your life your very all oh, there's something that will happen to the world you can't explain but the little that you seem to have will never be the same Okay, so it's conservative enough um, to be in a lot of Bob Jones churches, but right. it had a little bit too much syncopation, had too much bluegrass, but it was it was um, folksy enough to connect with people in the South and in the North. Um, they liked, you know, we we play brass, we'd sing a cappella, um, sub, you know. So we went all different places, and and it kind of has an Americana sound to it, you know. And so, okay, so two questions. So was your father kind of aware where he was geographically and was therefore choosing the songs and the music in relation to, which is fine. I'm just wondering we, we if he... did some of that. We did some of that, but it, okay. wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, we're here in the north, so we won't use any bluegrass. Okay. And that song, like something like this that you just played, mm -hmm. um, would, it, would some churches have not accepted you guys? It depended. Um, <clears throat> we didn't have a lot. Of, like, I'll tell you an example. One time we were singing at a church and we'd sing songs like that. And we did some, you know, bluegrass, light bluegrass. And somebody left the church. They left the service. Uh, while, during the service, they got up and left. And when we got out to our bus afterwards, there was a note on the door. It said, I'm sorry, it's still rock music. And so, you know, and, and it, that's the kind of thing that you're dealing with with people. There's not a lot of discernment. And but people are very picky because they think that there is one godly divine music, and I think that it's more it's more spiritually discerned than it is actually on paper, because yes. of the fact that the God didn't give us sheet music. Correct. Well, and and what what godly music was in churches three hundred years ago is definitely what not what it, they that didn't sound like hymns sound today. No. No. No, what I mean that that what I just played would probably not have been accepted by certainly by Moody Sankey, you know. No, you, no, no. Even the words, you know, John uh, John Wesley and and uh, and Charles Wesley had a fight. Well, Charles Wesley really had the fight uh, when John Wesley talked about the Jesus lover of my soul, mm -hmm. and and that's like a kind of high churchy kind of solemn kind of song, you know. Jesus oh, yeah. lover of my soul. Charles Wesley said, "You can't call Jesus lover of my soul." For him, yeah. that was like. What we think of like Jesus boyfriend songs in California to Charles Wesley, <laughs> John yep. Wesley was Jesus boyfriend song. Yes. And the same is true with, uh, in the garden by, um, Austin really? Miles. Yeah. No, about and the prayer. Walked, this, yeah, because I come to the garden alone. What yep. I do is still, it, it was like a, a romantic song. It was kind of, uh, held at arm's mm. length at first. He walks with me and talks with me. Yeah. It was too romantic because it came out of that time frame of the romantic period. And uh, so people really didn't like it at first. Wow. I'm going to tell uh, my mom she really dislikes that song. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can look up the controversy. There's, extra. there's plenty there. <laughs> there's plenty there. Um, so that's kind of the Bob Jones thing. Um, the The other big thing that, I, that we went to when I was growing up was it, it was a little bit more when I was kind of a teenager. They started seeing seeing more uh traction at least we went to their churches and and saw you know what the lord was doing there but that was the uh the group from hiles anderson college which is from yeah. hammond indiana and uh and jack hiles had been a southern baptist pastor and he, he when he was pastoring in garland texas he left the southern baptist convention and became an independent baptist pastor and so he was one of the big uh movers and shakers he eventually moved up to hammond indiana and pastored, you know, what became the world's largest Sunday school there in in uh, First Baptist. And so those guys, they were they're all about soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. And uh, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing there on one side. There's there was a danger at some points of what people called easy believism. You know, we say one, two, three, repeat after me. But I do think a lot of men addressed those concerns and tried to really dig down. Um, there was never really a lot of deep Bible teaching, but there was a real love for souls and, uh, and a real, mm -hmm. a, an ability to, to connect with communities, to reach out, see people saved, 
And, uh, you know, they, a lot of people went back and again, and again, it, they had the heyday in the seventies and eighties. Uh, lots of people were going there, lots and lots and lots. And a lot of pastors came out and they also started churches. Yeah. They had city, city closing parades, that church. What are you referring to? Um, Hiles and Hiles' church. They like, they would organize a parade if I, if I understood correctly, like they, they organize a parade just, and this, like the main street of the city would shut down and it would mm -hmm. be the event. Yeah, I mean, they, they, thousands and thousands of people, I think they said they had, they have campuses all over Chicago and all over the area that one, one Sunday they had like 50,000 people in attendance, something like that. Yeah. Um, that was way back, way back then. And again, the emphasis, each of these camps, there's, and there's pros and cons and everything. And yeah, you know, there's some people that say we don't have a camp, but then there's other, someone else joins them and now they have a now camp. Now you have a camp. Yeah. That's the, that's the eye of Christ. Yeah, we got to be careful to, I mean, it always, it says a lot to me that Paul reproves not only the people who are saying, I have Paul and I have Apollos, but he also reproves the guy who says, I have Christ, mm -hmm. which you want to have the right attitude, but some people are just being sanctimonious about it. I mean, you know, I, I just follow Jesus. I'm not part of any camp. Well, right. I mean, okay, but I got a good friend of mine, Brendan Offer. I think he's, he's a noble man, pretty well balanced, a Christian. Like he tells me, he's like, look, I am, a, I realize Oh, the weaknesses of what, what my camp are. And they really grieve me, but I don't have a problem still being part of that camp. No, I mean, and I, I think it's part of that's, that's some kind of spiritual maturity there. Absolutely. Absolutely. My, my wife went to, uh, um, Crown college. I went to landmark Baptist college, which is a very small college down in central Florida, Haines city. Um, pastor, um, Pastor Mickey Carter was mm -hmm. the was the pastor and started that college. And uh, typically, what happens is you get a man who gets some traction in a community. You said your wife church. went to Crown. My wife went to Crown. Yep. So that's Sexton in Tennessee. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, my oldest my oldest sister married a guy who went to uh, Baptist Bible College. Graduated in the in the eighties. That's Missouri. And then the Montoros. Baptist Bible College, Missouri? In Missouri, yes. Okay. All right. Yep. I'm placing them now. Okay. My second sister married, and this is one we have not talked about, a group. Um, she married a graduate of Pensacola Christian College. Okay. Which Pensacola is an offshoot from Bob Jones in the sense that Arlen and Becky Horton graduated from, um, from Bob Jones University, and they desired to start a Christian school, which they did in the early 70s there in Pensacola. Okay. Um, just basically an academy, Pensacola Christian Academy. <clears throat> and then, uh, so so she graduated. And my third sister married a guy who went to Bob Jones University for a while, and then he transferred to Letourneau uh, Technical College or University, whatever it was. I don't know if you've ever read the story of uh, Letourneau, the guy with the huge earth movers. He developed a bunch back in the um, World War II. They were used and, you know, just made tons of money. And gave supposedly at one point he gave ninety percent of his income to the Lord. I've heard of that story. Okay, yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, and so that's very interesting. And then uh, j just the, the 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 you know the differences between all those. <clears throat> and then um, PCC was was another. It's another one of the. It's really one of the big movers and shakers now. Um, there are others that have that have come along um, since then, such as in in Kentucky. Like Lexington, there's a, 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 a heard smaller ta uh, Bible college called Commonwealth Baptist College. Okay, let's see here. That Kentucky, started... <clears throat> Kentucky, north of Tennessee. I'd, my my brother-in-law is Tennessean. My sister is married to him. And I saw a T-shirt in Tennessee that says, at least we're not Kentucky. <laughs> That's not <what's> <laughs> ah, exactly. <laughs> Some of the outliers, I would say, for my, you know, and I'm sorry this is all about my growing up and, and everything. I don't want to be too self-centered, but. Just kind of give an overview. Some of the, I would say, outliers, not in the sense of less important, but just had fewer. It seemed to had fewer graduates, um, possibly that 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 had our family in, which doesn't necessarily mean anything. But we hit a lot of the a lot of the well known churches in the states. Um, Midwestern Baptist College was in Pontiac, um, Michigan, and that was Tom Malone. And there was a lot of guys who you know, went there as well and did, did well. Um, that was a, you know, that was 
go uh, going great guns for a long time. Um, it's no longer really doing as well. Um, it 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 you know it's still there. I guess it was founded in 1953. Um, it's not the same as it used to be, but it's still going. Can you tell, can you say just a little bit more about the Lexington thing in Kentucky? Who those guys are? <laughs> okay, so uh, that that is a graduate of Hiles Anderson College. That's Kentucky. And yes, that's Pastor Jeff Fugate. And uh, I've heard that name. That is uh, he he carries on much much the uh, the spirit of Doctor Hiles. Okay. And uh, and that emphasis, and he's connected with uh, people like you know evangelist Dennis Coral and okay, yes, and, I've heard of preachers. Yeah. Yep. So uh, yeah, that's that's been that he's been a blessing. Some good folks coming out of there. Um, but of course, it's interesting because it, you know students. It takes a while to get. You know, it, it seems that the, a lot of times that you get students who are willing to to lock in at the beginning. And that's some of the best years uh, of a college is at the beginning, five, 10 years. Hmm. And then it grows and grows because what happens is people hear about it. It takes a while to, to hear about it and get its reputation. And then when it gets big, it's typically not, not quite as strong um, because, you know, a little, it, it seems like it just a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. And now you're, it, I don't know. It, right, that's a story of any growing ministry. Yeah, right? because, I mean, the Lord promised, obviously, to that he would build his church and preserve his church unto him be glory in the church, uh, you know, throughout all ages, world without end. It's glory in the church and specifically the local church, the gathering of the believers. Um, and so as a result of that, what happens is you you end up with building something that God did not promise to preserve, God did not promise to to build. And it can be a blessing and it's been a help to people, but you're built, you're bringing in people from all over and they're not part of a body of a local church body. And okay. they're part of the body of Christ. They're all saved. They're going to be in heaven together, but they're not part of a local church body. And it has a way of affecting, affecting that. So, yeah. Um, another one was Maranatha, uh, up in Watertown, Wisconsin, Maranatha I've heard of Baptist that. Bible college originally. Okay, and then it Wisconsin. became Let's look at the university. Uh, Wisconsin that, is up north. Okay, that's yep, Wisconsin. Wisconsin's up north, next to Minnesota, and Michigan. Maranatha, separated by Lake Michigan. And who's those guys? Who are those guys? Uh, Maranatha Baptist University is but, what it is now. And they came out of where? Uh, that was Dr. Myron Cedarholm, and he was a pastor of a church, but I don't know where he came from. I think he was probably, I have to go back and look, probably with uh, the Northern Baptist Convention, um, some offshoot of that. How do you remember all those names? Uh, it's just growing up, you, yeah. hear them, you know, okay. I hear them all the time. So this uh, is where, to, to be, for the people who are listening, this is in the realm of like Baptist evangelical kind of fundamentalist yeah 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 and fundamental and and more specifically a lot of these independent baptist or they became that okay so yeah um and i i didn't realize this pillsbury baptist college P pillsbury baptist bible college uh that's where maranatha came from so Pillsbury used to be a pretty solid Bible college. And then Isn't like Pillsbury in California. No, it's in, um, oh, where's Pillsbury? It's down South somewhere, North Carolina. Pil I think it's, I think it was North Carolina. Did you say Pillsbury Baptist college? Yep. No, wait a second. I'm way off Pillsbury Baptist Bible college in Minnesota. Pillsbury? I'm thinking of something else, but I'm thinking of something else. Independent Baptist College in Owatonna, Minnesota. Yep. And Minnesota is it's, uh, west, west of, Wisconsin. of Wisconsin. So it goes Michigan, then Lake Michigan, then Wisconsin, then Minnesota. Well, what's Baptist interesting about College. that, about Maranatha, is that is the school that Jack Treber went to. Jack Trooper went there, was trained in music, and uh, and then he was influenced also by Jack Hiles, 
he started a church out in California, or he took a church, and uh, they eventually started Golden State Baptist Bible Co or Golden State Baptist College. Hey, Golden, and that that's still going. Um, Golden State is it Baptist or just Bible? I think it's Bible. Yeah, Golden State Baptist College. Oh, is it? It's Baptist. GSBC for me. Baptist College. So Trevor um, was influenced. He's Maranatha and and influenced some Ohio's. Yep. Yeah. Big influence. influence on soul winning. Uh, soul winning was a big influence. And so the church is, you know, they're right there in Silicon Valley and they've got property. They've got amazing, amazing building, amazing auditorium. <coughs> and then uh, a, a, an offshoot a connection. And so, so many folks were influenced by Dr. Hiles. I mean, he was a major voice in the, uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, major voice. Um, an offshoot somewhat of PCBBC. But through um, was a graduate of PCBBC was Paul Chapel. Okay, I've heard that name recently too. But he was he was really influenced also by Dr. Robertson, Dr. Hiles, um, and some of the there was you know there, down in the in the eighties and nineties there was some controversy with Dr. Hiles various ways. Of course, a lot of envy because he was so yeah so successful. But there were some concerns here and there, and and. Uh, Dr. Brother Chapel never really went hardcore Hiles in that sense. Uh, he was he was much more along the lines of Dr. Sexton and Lee Robertson. You know, from what I understand, like Pastor Hiles had such an influence on them. Even like young preachers would even mimic his manner. And, and I, to yep. some extent, I think that happens everywhere. But from what I've heard, like I don't know if that's an exaggeration. People have told me like grown men would even dress in his style and like mm -hmm. mimic oh, his yeah. mannerisms. Oh yeah, it was, it was, it's a very, as if the power of God lay in those things. Well, and that's, it's, you know, if you've been in that, you understand what it's like. It, 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 it's like church is everything. So there's nothing but church and, um, there's no outside, like everything is dictated. And, and, and this is the way fundamentalism was in general, because that's the way America was. It's like, everyone was very well controlled and thought the same and you know unified especially in the the golden years after world war ii uh it was just very connected and and and, to, and then not until the 60s when you had the the drug culture coming in and the rebellion of rock music and um you know all the people that were the baby boomers were growing up and they kind of it's amazing that that happened so fast it's oh amazing. yeah i can't get over very it. quickly when I look at so the those okay, are some so of the paul, major ones paul chapel started what he started uh, what's known, he started, I'm not remember what year it was, but it was like late 80s, I'm sorry, late late 90s, somewhere in there. He started West Coast Baptist College. And uh, they're probably one of the most, uh, have, have the biggest student population of independent Baptist college, uh, as far as I know, in America today. Wow. So, yeah, they, I'm trying to remember what year that was. I'm going to look that up because... Yeah, 95. 95. And I knew I knew some of the uh, original students. Um, you know, they're still going on today and serving the Lord. So uh, they've, you know they've, what? Con Go ahead. they've continued on. Uh, and, and so that's those are I would say those are the major ones. Now, we haven't talked about one school in particular that's had a big influence <laughs> on you and on me. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you're mentioning all this because it makes you, it makes me feel small, you know, that, oh yeah, the world, you know, you know, your pond and then you realize there's a notion out there of, mm -hmm. of good, good Christian people. Absolutely. Um, the Lord's doing all that with all those people who are different than you. It's really cool. Yeah. And yeah. And then there's the one uh, Maverick. And there is a in the true... spirit of, uh, in the spirit of J. Frank Norris, really a little it bit. It really is. It really yeah. is. And he was a great yeah. admirer of Norris. So one of the uh one of the prize pupils, at least to hear him tell it, of Dr. <laughs> Bob Jones Sr. <laughs> was was and, and I and I have no reason to doubt it because because of the uh because of the co the correspondence, the personal private correspondence between yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Bob Jones Sr. and because of the abilities of this man. Yeah. Uh he, he got saved at uh in his 20s i think he was 27 29 
was if he? I recall, yeah, I, if I recall, um, 29, yeah. A man by the name of Peter Sturgis Ruckman. And this is where everybody breaks fellowship with us. And it's where the podcast <laughs> comes to an end. It's, it's, that's, I mean, we're truly at our wit's end at that point. But I have lots of, growing up, we would be um, in one church, you know, where it was, you know, whatever camp it was. And Dr. Ruckman was a heretic and maybe not even saved. And then the next week we'd be at a church where, you know, they love Dr. Ruckman and uh, he's the fourth member he's of the Trinity Elijah, or whatever, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's it's so crazy that the extremes. But anyhow, he went to Bob Jones um, University and really fell in love with Dr. Bob Jones Sr. And uh, really hated Bob Jones Jr. for whatever reason. And I think there is, it was sibling rivalry to a certain degree or mm. i think that peter ruckman was kind of a uh what what would you call it uh, a surrogate son type of a of a thing okay and that there was well, envy between both of them so bob jones jr the second mm -hmm. had a picture of my mom's pastor on his desk my my mom's lebanese pastor really yeah that's how tight they were victor sadaka Mr. Wow. Sadaka was a guy, a guy by the name of Green, American missionary by the name of Green. His family name was Green. <clears throat> Came to, to Lebanon and started First Baptist Bible Church in Beirut uh, on Makhoul Street, which is right behind Bliss Street, which is basically the hard by the American University of Beirut, the biggest kind of university from Seoul to, to, to Italy. And um, somehow, I don't know how, but Victor Sadaka, who took, took over from Green, hooked up with Bob Jones the second and they were like buddy buddy for a long wow. time I and I met Bob Jones the third in Beirut when he came for a conference on Middle Eastern Christianity you met the third the third yeah okay. the Shakespearean actor um well he was a very cultured man Bob Jones Bob Jones senior was I think, as he, well. I think even his son Stephen yep yeah I think his son was with him too yeah. wow very interesting <laughs> Um, yeah, he was a he, senior was a cultured man. He'd been around the block and then junior was even more. So he was a Shakespearean actor, um, an artist and, uh, a musician. And they, in Dr. Dr. Bob senior wanted the college to be basically to have the capabilities of a liberal arts school and be a preacher school at the same time. So right. they had, they added, you know, when, when junior came, they really emphasized the drama, the art, they have a, a huge art collection there. And so forth. Well, Peter Ruckman comes into that having been a musician of sorts, a DJ, having been an artist, you know, in, okay. in his own right. Um, and, and, and a great artist, according to him, I guess. Yes. Yes. Well, <laughs> but, he, uh, we'll say one thing. He did a lot of paintings. He did a lot of drawings. He did. But, but like, I think if there's popular, one thing he, he over evaluated is, is his artistic ability. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he certainly was more of a, a populist type of a, a popular painter. He he painted yeah. things that were very um, accessible, and uh, there was a couple that I've seen that it were that were more detailed. But that was not his focus. His focus was for people, so chalk talks and paintings right. for books and things like that. So, uh, but over time, what what he realized was when he got there, he was led to Christ by Hugh Pyle. Right. When he got to Bob Jones University, he realized that they're correcting the Bible, the King James Bible, every other word. So they're saying, this is the Bible. This is the, the final authority. And then they're correcting it, which of course is ludicrous. How can it be the final authority if you're the one saying it's wrong? And so that's right. where he saw the disconnect. He said that this is a, you know, this can't work. And so he began studying and he became, um, okay. So proficient. that was his first encounter with that. He, on his own, he kind of saw the disconnect. He perceived oh. that on his own as a student in Bob Jones? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because he's sitting there listening and, and his dad had been um, a professor at MIT. Like, uh, really? Yeah. Okay. His, his dad was an instructor of some kind at MIT. He was a brilliant man, but he, he was military all the way. His grandparents, mm -hmm. his granddad was in military, like from, I don't know, yeah, generations. And so he's a, a, a very smart man. And he had the genes of, in, of intellectualism and yet, so he could see what was happening. And plus he'd been around the block. He'd been a drill sergeant in the army right, over okay. in the Philippines. Yeah. And so he was a, a worldly wise man, 
So he wasn't intimidated by by men in right, general. Right, right. And but he was smart. So he's sitting there and he's asking questions. Now, to hear you know Bob Jones say it, he's a troublemaker. He's you know a Bob Jones rabble the rouser. Yeah, Bob Jones the second. Yeah, Bob Jones the first loved him, and would correspond with him individually, like privately. And uh, I remember re reading a story here, and Doctor Ruckman talk about how um, he got a postcard from Bob Jones Senior. It said, "Hey Pete." Stop feeling sorry for yourself and do something for God. Something along those lines. All right. That that type of personal communication. Right. So what happens is over the years, um, he 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 graduates with honors. As far as I know, it was with honors from Bob Jones University, and then he goes out and he pastored first a Southern Baptist church, and then there became rift over the years because he began to expose the hypocrisy of saying that you have the Bible and correcting the Bible. And of the Greek professors, the Greek instructors, calling them out, guys like Stuart Custer. And, and he, he just kept pushing that, pushing that. For a while there, he was very popular in the BBF. Um, guys like J, J, uh, John Rawlings. BBF. The Baptist Bible Fellowship. Okay, I've heard of Rawlings. One of the greatest he preachers pastored. I ever heard was connected with him. J.C. House. I don't know if he's still yep. on earth. J.C. House was connected with Rawlings. J.C. Haas is, is a preacher's preacher. Hmm. He's a man of the craft. He really is. So Rawlings is, yeah. So who is Rawlings? Because if I if I remember correctly, he pastored a big church. He pastored Lamart Baptist Church in Cincinnati. Oh, that's yeah. Ohio. Yep. Okay, so. It was a big church. But that's not a college or. or no, a no. He he uh, he was just a hard-nosed preacher and thought, saw a lot of people saved, built a big church, and um, went to. Uh, he, he hung out with J. Frank Norris and those guys back in the day. Okay, so Rawlings is in Ohio. And how, how did he come into the conversation, Rawlings? Um, he was one of the guys that Peter Ruckman used to preach for. Okay. He used to preach for, for all the guys in the BBF, basically. Okay. G.B. Vic. Um, he used to preach at a thing called Camp Chautauqua down near Cincinnati. And it would be hundreds and hundreds of kids even i think maybe even a thousand kids in a week and he would be down there for six or eight weeks he'd he'd, he'd uh go to those camps you and, ever heard you ever heard him tell that story in his book he says he was in the back of the car at some point and he was trying to reconcile uh, j frank norris and beecham vick and the wives were like the wife of beecham vick was there no and he's like in the back of the car and kind of working trying to prod them to reconciliation mm. and but there were some terrible things that were done um, and then the wife kind of just snapped, like she basically said, it's not going to be on this side of heaven. Hmm. And that was it. Man. It's nasty. It's nasty. So I think, I think at some point, you know, things get so big that there's no, I got too much to lose in my mind. I can't let it go hmm. you know, bigger, better, faster, stronger. I just can't, I can't let it go. Cause I'll, I'll lose so much. Hmm. And, um, but anyhow, so Ruckman was there, and then Ruckman, um, hit, when he got married, uh, when he got saved, he was married to an unsaved woman, obviously, and she, I think, made a profession of faith and so forth. And then over time, um, they just couldn't stay together. She didn't want to be with him in ministry, and he said later on in his life that he was harsh with her and, and difficult to live with. He was fired up, a lot of zeal for the mm -hmm. Lord. So they ended up getting divorced after he was pastor. Um, and he was, he lived alone for, I think, 10 years with several kids. She left him and, um, he raised kids in it at some point in the, uh, I can't remember the exact time frame, but he got remarried. Um, and it was, it was kind of an ill-advised marriage. It was, it was not something that was, uh, it, it, you know, I, if I were me and I was his pastor, I wouldn't have advised it, but I'm not, I'm just saying that from, from the outside perspective, it'd be like, what is he doing? He got remarried and it didn't last very long. It was a, a really difficult scenario. So um, now he's divorced twice. And this is this is the main reason why people stopped. You know, like I know our pastor, well, Mick I mean, Carter. He's railing on them for the King James issue and then he's thrice married. So right. you got a powerful combo there. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes it really difficult to, to listen to him, um, especially if. If it's, you know, one thing about independent fundamental Baptists in the 50s and 60s, there was an emphasis on clean living, on morality, 
and uh, you didn't find things in, in J. Frank Norris's life. It, you know, he was not accused of being a womanizer. He was harsh. He was a tyrant, but he was not sleeping around with a bunch of women. Um, and that was something that didn't really happen in, in mainstream. Like, for instance, Lee Robertson, clean as a whistle, man. Cy My Myron Cedarholm, clean as a whistle. Oh, These guys. While you're there, um, and praise God, that's very encouraging. That just You don't hear about those, you know, guys who finish clean who had big ministries. Mm. Um, big name for me, it seemed, Harold Seidler. Yes. Who's who? Where is he? Carolinas. Uh, Harold Seidler is also in Greenville. He was in Greenville, South Carolina. Okay, and, and he started. He started uh, Tabernacle Baptist Church, or he became the pastor. A lot of times, that's what happened. The guys took a church, not started it. Um, but yeah, where he was trained, I don't know. Um, that's that's a really interesting, interesting question because I I haven't really studied that out. He could preach that guy. Oh yeah, Harold Seidler could preach, man. Here, listen. Yep, it's amazing because it. Sometimes you think, well, where was he trained? Well, maybe he was trained by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's <laughs> you right. know how know how know with this man letters. Yeah, exactly. He didn't study with us. Yeah, how could, how could he be used? In <laughs> how God? could he know the Bible? Yeah, he certainly doesn't know what we know. Oh man, um, so yeah, he 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 was a he was a great man. But uh, so the, the, what happened is back to Dr. Ruckman, then he from this is just my Cliss Note version. So he became persona non grata with the BBF and, and fundamentalism at large. And there were certain people who still connected with him and so forth. But basically, the big boys were done with him. And I think that at that point, it really kind of affected him because when you look at what he's been mm. through and the things mm. that he experienced, it wasn't all easy. Uh, and you can disagree with the decisions and all that, but it wasn't like if you, if you think Dr. Ruckman was just some nefarious, you know, womanizer, you don't know much about him. You know, um, I think he, in my opinion, I think that that was a stain on his, on his reputation, obviously to be divorced and then remarried three, you know, three times, I, I or at least he was divorced twice, yeah. um, twice and married three times. Uh, I think there was a stain on his reputation. Um, but what I've had to, what I've realized is this. He had reasons for what he did. He answered to the local church that he was, you know, a part of. And I think he he had to live with the consequences of his actions. But you can separate that from what he taught about the scripture. Some people hate that thought. They they hate the idea that, you know, well, if he's a bad man, then we don't want we don't learn our doctrine from the actions of the man that teaches us doctrine. It's very difficult to separate those things in our mind. And we have to be careful that we're not influenced uh, wrongly when a person makes a decision. But I will say the biggest question is, what is he saying about the Bible? That's the biggest question. Not what kind of a man is he? Uh, as far as... And, 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 to, and, he, and he was a godly man. I mean, and he was a godly man. I mean, when I read, when I read, he, when it came to the Bible issue, he railed on people, anybody, who didn't care who was. Yep. And then he would, and I'd read about him in another book. I was actually corresponding in a forum with John R. Rice, John R. Rice's grandson. And, you know, you can imagine how he feels about Ruckman. Because Ruckman would rail on, on John R. Rice for not believing the book. And, um, and you know, John R. Rice left a great legacy and his grandson is a missionary to the J uh, Japanese and things like that. And I told him, I said, I learned some nice things about John R. Rice from Ruckman. He's like, no, you didn't. I'm like, yes, I did. It's I can't remember where the book is, you know. And I promise him where I find them. I'll, I'll when I find it in the books, I'll, I'll show him because Ruckman would talk very well about s some of the guys he was railing on about the King James issue. He could separate. Yeah. He can go on and say, listen, you want to learn how to run a church? Look to that guy. You want to yep. learn how to uh, so do soul winning? Look to this guy. Mm -hmm. And he would point to guys that he would condemn for their um, disbelief or their correction of the King of the Bible, you know. So yeah. as a young man reading that, you do get, you do absorb some of that caustic attitude and, you know, it's like stage cage kind of Ruckmanism, but it helped for me. I would see that. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. He's still talking well about those guys. I just heard him say something the other day about, uh, about someone I, and, and he, I didn't even realize the struggle that this person had. And he said, you know, basically you want that kind of ministry. You want that. Well, then you're going to have to deal with this. 
and he mentioned he mentioned that it's very well known and uh basically saying you can't handle you wouldn't be able to handle what they put up with all these right. years in order to right. get the kind of ministry they had right. so you know and and i hope that if you're listening and you're a, you know a, a, a ruckmanite or a dyed in the wool you understand where i'm coming from um i i do think that uh, dr ruckman was convinced that he was right but i also know that that later on in his life um that he he said you know i i was harsh towards that woman you know and it was it was very difficult for her i made it difficult for her and uh what does that mean it just means that he made mistakes and he sinned like all of us have and what i what i it's interesting because i was raised in the bbf even though there were some changes and uh you know i was around different people different schools all of that um i ended up in if you want to say in a camp i ended up in a bible believing camp which some people <laughs> uh call the ruckmanite camp but really it is and i understand why they say that but one of the features that i love about the bible believing camp is that it truly is about the bible um i'm not a hundred percent for hiles fan they used to back in the 80s they used to wear buttons 100 percent for hiles people did um i'm not a hundred percent ruckman fan i'm not even a hundred percent jonathan marshall fan right right um but i am a hundred percent bible fan and i am going to stand with the king james bible and and my and it's interesting my brother and i both uh came to that position having traveled around and seen all these different camps and groups we said this is this is the, oh. the people that believe the king james bible is the word of god they're not all graduates of pensacola bible institute um why because the holy spirit teaches you that the word of god is pure right you're saying just to clarify you're saying not all king james bible believers are ruckmanites right exactly which might be a shock to some people's systems but right but, and, but it's and true. I, in fact i think in some ways people they they're so afraid of of ruckman uh of ruckman that they may not even come out and stand for the king james bible in the same yeah. way because of that which i think it, is a, a a tactic of the devil too yeah um you know we we're not here to further the cause of dr ruckman but i will say this when you're studying the word of god you can find out a lot of things about the bible that you didn't know when you read his commentaries and he is not going to cast doubt on the bible that you hold in your hands that is an unusual thing when i say cast doubt i mean he doesn't go to the greek and say this word should more properly be translated right. this word right so in other words the king james bible is wrong in this area right the greek is right which of course we know is a shell game because the greek what's that no one knows greek right. you have to define greek with a lexicon yeah and which greek and which, which, greek, which greek text? Are you going to? Yeah, 20, 23 versions of the text of Receptus. So, um, so I want, go ahead. I want to ask you a question. I heard this, I heard, overheard Pastor Saul years ago at, at, at Hope uh, in Toledo. Um, I don't know who he was talking to. There was a couple of guys there around him. And he talked about a golden opportunity that Ruckman had to actually head PPC, P, uh, PCC, to be the head of PCC. Mm -hmm. um, something was offered to him and I'm, I'm and, you know that's why i'm asking you so i don't know the guys don't take it for like gospel or anything but i overheard him say that and something happened and he was kind of pastor Saul was kind of shaking his head uh ruining the fact that you know that the ruckman didn't make it work and he was imagining so if ruckman had had made that work at a small cost that there's no telling the kind of influence he would have had can you imagine Ruckman being the head of PCC essentially rather than than obscure PBI? Now he says he wanted it to be obscure because he's all military and he liked the like junkyard dog aspect, right? Well, and I again I think there's there's uh okay. there's two two parts of it. I think Dr. Ruckman was popular back in the sixties and seventies. I've got him on a picture with all the main all the mainstream guys, big time. Um, a poster with his picture on it. Okay. He was right in there. Um that was he was popular well before his popularity for being a junkyard dog he was popular for being a good bible teacher and an illustrator and, and preacher yeah you know just a preacher yeah good and on then both. when he got the when he got remarried um i think the divorce hurt things um his wife even though his wife left him and then when he got remarried that's when a lot of guys said okay i can't i can't go with you right here. right um 
And so that, but then he became over time, he kind of became known, uh, almost okay. like underground. Okay. Like, have you heard about this guy? Right. And, uh, so unfortunately I think that, that kind of had brought with it a spirit of like, yeah, we're the raw, we're the underground, we're the hardcore guys. Interesting. Good. So it's a two different, it's two different sides of his ministry. And, but one thing that stayed the same was his, his belief in the Bible and his ability to teach the Bible. And he, you know, of course he was heavily influenced by, um, you know, by Schofield and, um, oh, yeah, Larkin and, and Stam Larkin, and Bollinger, yeah. Bollinger, Stam, all these guys who was heavily influenced by him. But one, one thing that was different is he never corrected the words of the King James Bible. Right. And that's really what, so we know if you want to know what I believe, I believe the King James Bible is the word of God from cover to cover. And I believe that those words are the ones God intends for me to have. And you say, well, what about the Greek? What about, okay, all those things are somehow connected with the word of God as well. But I'm not going to be able to nail down and say that, that those 5,000 manuscripts right there, that's the word of God. Well, what happens if they disagree? What happens if they're, they don't all contain the same words, blah, blah, blah. So what I say is God did all that work for me. And he put the words that he wanted me to have in the King James Bible. And I trust that, take it by faith. And that's what, that's the reason why I was attracted to um, the Dr. Ruckman camp. I never went to school there. Uh, lots of friends that went there. But I know this, all of those, every friend I have that went to PBI, and that includes Dr. Uh, Pastor Sowell, they all say, my authority is not Dr. Ruckman. My authority is the Bible. Now, he happened to teach me a lot about the Bible. But he didn't write any of it. He had nothing to do with the writing of the King James Bible right. or the translating of it. Yeah, I... And and so, in my mind, it's it's one of the uh, most freeing places. Now, you got to be ready because people are looking for you know ways to take him down and criticize him. And I think there's some legitimate things like I disagree with them about uh, about racism. Um, I disagree with them about abortion. Um, there's several things that I disagree with them about. But at the end of the day, who knows me? Who cares about me? It doesn't matter. What's well, the even the racism? Like I've, I've, I've heard him. I've heard him and read, read him say very kind, charitable things about different races that, in other places, he he kind of, uh, um, scorns. There is a little, there was a little bit of scorn. Yes, um, and there and again, some of the stuff is nuanced. You know, yeah. do I believe that races have characteristics? Ab absolutely. Do right. I believe that there were three races that developed after the flood? Absolutely. Um, right. You know, I, I think, yes, of course I believe that. I think that he was also a product of his generation in that era. Yeah. I think there was a lot of racism going on at that time. Yeah. You know, I, I, I heard, it, uh, not directly, but I heard a pastor who told me he listened directly to the recording of a pastor who said he had never met someone of a certain race that ever did anything for God. And... Huh. You know, it was ludicrous. Of course, there was yeah, no, men. Did you read your Bible? <laughs> so, exactly. Maybe then meet. Yeah, maybe in person. So, so you saying, have still, to be careful. Not... You know, but but I would say this: a lot of our generation today, a lot of our our pastors today, they're afraid of their own shadow, because what what is their, um, who is their leader? Who is their guru? That's what they're ba the betting on. They're banking on their leader being right. They're banking mm -hmm. on him knowing more. And what typically is, well, look at the size of my church. That's how you know that. Yes, I'm right. yes, yes. And I'm just telling you the foundation of our faith is the words of the Bible. That's good. Not the, not the size of the church or the size of the fellowship. It's the words of the King James Bible. I better understand now the, how, why he got so bitter. I, I can understand it now being dropped from being like running around with the big boys and becoming persona non grata, as you said. Mm. Okay, so I, I got to actually go but one last question so I, I have lines flying through here all over but first baptist of fort worth texas i got no arrows coming out of that well obviously um bbc came out of that okay right right another big one that came out of that was the dayton baptist temple um that's where pastor sowell got saved that's what that what was, is that what's the that was that's Gerald church Fleming, pastor of dayton baptist temple that's a okay, so it's a he was one of Norris's guys, so to speak. Dayton Baptist. This is in Texas? Uh, no, that's in uh, Ohio, Southern Ohio, not far from C Cincinnati. 
Dayton Baptist. Temple. And he was he 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 was the pastor of that church. It was a large church in Dayton. There was tons of Baptist temples in Ohio, Akron, um, Mansfield, Canton. You know, there was actually a title Baptist, Baptist temple for pastor years. Pastor Saul Senior got saved there. Mister yes. Saul. Uh, he, well, pastor of Hope Baptist Church in Toledo got okay. saved there at five years of age. Joe Henry Hankins was preaching. Okay. Another cool right. tie-in, Pastor Sowell's mom was Rosie the Riveter. If you ever heard of Rosie the Riveter, <laughs> the, the kind of woman that went to work in the factories during World War II. Okay, I thought she was actually Rosie the Riveter on the, <laughs> she the, was figurine, one of the, the figurine on the, on the airplane. During one of the breaks at the factory, the airplane factory where she worked, J. Frank Norris came in and preached. Crazy, man. That's cool. So, yeah, very cool. Uh, on my dad's side, my dad went to, to Akron Baptist Temple, got saved there. And um, so it's, it's, it's cool to see all the, all the connections. There's so many. And, you know, if you, if you get a, I'll just, maybe we got to bring this to a close. I'll just say, if you're listening and, and you're, you want to correct me over something, that's no problem. It, it, I, if I'm factually wrong in something, let me know. Uh, Witsendguys at gmail.com is our email address. I will say this though. Um, this is my perspective after, after living 22 years traveling around the country and being in all different kinds of camps. Uh, every camp has their guru. Uh, every camp has the same kind of person. We're right because we're right, because this is what we do. And every camp is a little bit myopic in some areas, um, you know, blindsided, don't see it. But every camp has their strength. And I, I'm willing to fellowship with you. And and really, if if you believe the King James Bible is the word of God, that's in my mind, that's top tier. Because I know where I'm dwelling, what I'm working with. I know the parameters, right? But even if you don't believe that, I can still fellowship with you. Yeah, I can same. still love you. Um, I don't know everything, and I don't think that anybody does. I really don't. And that includes anyone, anybody that I look up to. Why? Because the Lord said, um, let God be true and every man a liar. And so that's that's where I stand. George, you want to finish this out for us? Yeah, well, uh, I think to complete the list, I heard you're not really a Bible believer, so you and I now must break the fellowship. <laughs> This is the last podcast, friends. I'm sorry. <laughs> I must stand for my conviction. You're probably, you're probably right in somebody's mind. <laughs> no, I, I know you're a Bible believer, um, John, and, and I think in, in some ways you're more, even more than I am. And I thank God for the King James Bible. I mean, I'm from Lebanon. I believe it. And uh, I love all those camps. I think there's great work being done over the Lord in all those places. Hmm. Uh, and... Uh, the Lord is with them all. And I, you know what? I thank God that the Lord is using them despite their myopia and weaknesses because that means he can do the same with us. Yes. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. If you want to get in touch with us again, it's witsendguys at gmail.com. And Lord willing, we will catch you next time. Hopefully going to have Brother David Havman on here soon. Looking forward to that. So you guys take care and we'll catch you next time. Cool. God bless you guys.